Welcome to Happily Family. I'm Cecilia Hilke. And I'm Jason Hilke. And we are delighted today to have Dr. Daniel Peters with us. Dan is a psychologist, author, co-founder of Parent Footprint, host of the Parent Footprint podcast with Dr. Dan, and the executive director of the Summit Center, specializing in the assessment and treatment of children, adolescents, and families with gifted, talented, and creative individuals, as well as anxiety, learning differences, dyslexia, and more. He's a regular contributor to the Huffington Post and Psychology Today, and he speaks regularly at national conferences. Welcome, Dan. It's great to have you. Thanks for being back again, Dan. Good to talk to you. Yeah, thank you both. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you a question because, you know, it's just like you and us here because <laughs> you've written this book on anxiety to help parents solve their kids' anxiety. And I'm wondering, because it's just us, how many parents and families do you work with? Do you know where I'm going here? They bring their kid in and you're like, wait, the parents actually need this book more than the kids. Like, how often does that happen? Just throw out a percentage. Um there's often a there's often a high correlation and well let me put it this way it's not that all parents of anxious kids are anxious themselves but what i can say is a lot of times even kids being anxious makes parents anxious because of what they have to go through with their kids so there is there is a high incidence and i'm very transparent in the book because i say this is for parents too because it really is this two for one that what we're trying to do with our kids, we also need to be very mindful of how we think and how we act and how what we are modeling and how we're being in the world uh, in our own lives in front of our kids. Okay, so that totally makes I, sense to me. And yeah, not yeah, a big surprise. I know a pet percentage there, but it's there's correlations. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, so and to some extent, anxiety at least at low levels is perfectly normal. Um, but you talk about in the book they, we, that we have a survival response. Explain that. So the survival response, and this is, it's amazing that we learn about geography and we learn about capitals and we learn about all of this stuff, but we generally, you know, maybe later in high school and health, you might get this. So, so basically we all have these brains that we all know about, and we have our frontal lobe here where we do our great thinking. And then in our limbic system, in our emotional part of our brain, there's this little almond called the amygdala, which some people have heard of. That's our fear center. And that's the thing that is designed to keep us alive. So back when we are in the deserts and we are hunters and gatherers and there are saber tooth tigers and other tribes that are trying to take us and our people, that's the thing that keeps us alive. It's like always sensing, always sensing for danger. And when there is danger, boom, we have this system that goes into place to either fight or flight. Sometimes we freeze. That's not a good one. Like the freeze one, right? Deer in the headlights, that's not a good one. It does happen in intense fear situations. But often there's this fight where we're fighting for our lives or flying away, which means running as fast as we can. And what happens is when we get this signal, a message go straight to our adrenal glands to produce massive amounts of adrenaline to get to our arms and legs to make us first strong and run and shut down other parts of our symptoms or excuse me other parts of our body our organs when our body shuts down here's the catch we start to feel upset stomach because the blood is leaving our stomach to go to our arms and our legs we're starting to get woozy we're starting to get headaches because the blood is leaving our brain because we don't need to solve a complicated math problem jason right before when we are running for our life. Um, and so what happens is we get all of these physiological symptoms of the survival response that produces all of this avoidance and this anxiety. And if we can really help kids and ourselves understand this is a natural instinct and then start to ask ourselves, do I need my fight and flight response during this math test? Do I need it while I'm waiting to see if I get picked for the play? And so it allows us to start to know how our body works and start to talk to ourselves in a way that we can sort of turn down the volume. So, well, first I, I'm assuming there's not a lot of fear and anxiety that you have. So I will have the math questions for you later. But um, when, so if, if people are recognizing, like this is great to know this about how our body works, right? Like we know, uh, all right, this is, I'm, I'm feeling this way before I go on stage and I'm, I'm having this reaction. I recognize like knowing it's a first step, but then it just doesn't go away still. Like it's like, there's not a saber tooth tire track, you know, tracking me or going to attack me on the stage or, you know, like, so there's a logical side of it, 
But there's this other part that's going on that still ha has kind of taken right. over my body. What do we do about that? Do you have, and, and I mean, that could be like real practical tips, but like, could you talk a little more generally about like, what, what do we do, even though we know what's going on? One thing to think about is how to, and when I talk about this in the book, we talk about the worry monster as this sort of outside, um, this outside creature that gets to us. And when those of us who've dealt with anxiety or have kids that deal with anxiety, it's not all that shocking. Like what's shocking is when we have this panic attack that comes out of nowhere, or if you're not an anxious person, and then all of a sudden you get anxious about something, that's going to catch us off guard. But for those folks that have fairly regular anxiety or anxiety consistently in certain situations, it's almost like you have to befriend it and know it's coming. So instead of being sidelined by it, you have to be able to start to say to yourself, okay, here you are. I know you always come before a race, or I know you always come before I'm going to say a speech, and I have to breathe through this. So one thing is, again, to think about the breathing because our breathing constricts when we're scared. And when we can open up our diaphragm and do some belly breathing, actually breathe through it, that's one way to sit with it. Another way, another strategy, another thing to think about is like body surfing or surfing and you get crunched on a wave and you're getting kicked around under the surf and you know from experience that you are going to get kicked back up at some point and you just need to hold your breath. The thing about anxiety is it always stops. Even our terrible panic attacks, it always stops. And we need to be able to talk ourselves through this in a way that says, I'm going to get through this. I know what this is like. I'm going to be okay. It's, we call this self-talk. So the first thing's about the breathing through it, the self-talk through it, and then it's starting to really start to challenge your thinking. So we talk about metacognition or thinking about our thinking as a very important human, um, care, uh, human trait to be cultivated because folks who have metacognition tend to be able to be more successful in terms of carrying out relationships, carrying out problem solving, because you're thinking, okay, what am I thinking? What are you thinking? What might be going on here? So if we can help kids and ourselves learn to think about the generally the fear statement that we're having, I'm going to fail, I'm going to blow it, people are going to laugh at me, my mom's not going to remember me and leave me here, we can talk ourselves through it. This is the cognitive strategy that also starts to turn down the volume so we still have those feelings, but it's really about getting it down. Just to say, you're saying we all have a normal level of anxiety, getting it down to a level where it's not debilitating or really impacting us. So it makes sense. So I, I, what I hear is like, part of it is to start to recognize like, oh, here's that time. Like, here's the worry monster, right? Like, here's, here's this time and recognizing it for what it is. Knowing and it's, that, it's predictable too. Oh, like yeah, the, yeah. We can it start to anticipate when this might happen. We've probably been in it, it doesn't before. doesn't necessarily need to catch us off guard. And then we can do a couple things. I'll go backwards. One was like, no, we're going to be okay. Right. You talked about like when you're getting tossed in a wave, which I can relate to surfing. I've been tossed many times and, and I just like have to be like, it's okay. I can, I, I'll be okay. This will work out. This will be fine. And uh, even though it may feel completely like you're drowning in the moment and just letting it go through and knowing we've had the experience, knowing we're going to be out, we're going to be okay. And then the second thing is to, to be belly breathing, to like physiologically changing our body to react in a way that's healthy to the, to, to what we know is happening. Is that, is that uh, like a, what you were saying there, like in the yes. couple of pieces? That is, that's great. And there's, you're making me think of a third one that I, another one that I'd like to add to that, which um, is just so key. And it sounds so simple is to really focus on the present because when we're think when we're thinking about our thinking and we can identify our worrisome thoughts our fearful thoughts they always exist in something in the future mm -hmm. what if this happens what will i do if this happens and so what happens is that fearful future thinking which has not yet occurred it amps us up and puts on that fight and flight response when it isn't even a reality at this point so again this goes back to the mindfulness based strategies of staying very present. And then breathing is another way, instead of just belly breathing to, to get our grounding, breathing just to focus on our breath. So we're like, I'm fine right now. I'm okay. That hasn't happened yet. And this is big for all of us adults too, who have plenty of things that we're really good at worrying about with our kids, about the world, um, all that good stuff. Yes, yeah. I can relate to that. <laughs> so, and I want to get to all that good stuff.
I actually want to take a little step backwards because I don't think I've worked with kids professionally for most of my career. And um, I don't think that I've always noticed anxiety. Mm -hmm. I've realized what it actually looks like and identified it um, properly for what it is. How do we know as a parent, like what to look for and Mm -hmm. maybe when it's time to get some help. Mm -hmm. Like when it's healthy versus when it's, maybe not healthy. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And, and like what to look for in a kid? Like, how do you, how do you know if they're like maybe not wanting to go to school or disengaging? Like what? Yeah, a really good. It's a really good question. And what we see in kids is always behavior, right? So we're always looking at behavior and we as adults often interpret behavior very at face value instead of doing what I think you're suggesting here is kind of like pulling back the curtain and say like, what might be going on? And, you know, we say that behavior is a way of kids communicating. We know that kids don't like to be in trouble. We know that kids don't like people mad at them. But what we see a lot with things, anxiety is behavior in terms of avoidance under a desk, under a bed, refusal to go do something um, over and over and over and over again. Um, we also see the fight response, which is, you know, bring it on. I'm not going. You can't make me. And a lot of these times, I would say, look to anxiety first, as opposed to my child's just being difficult because, right? Because a lot of the times behind it, a child is worried. And depending on how you know your child, some kids are very out there. Other kids are more internalized. So there's the behavior. When you say what to look for, there is... um, There is the, I'm not going to do it. There is the running away. There is the talking back. You know, all of these things like, let's go. There's also nail biting, stomach aches, all the physiological stuff, headaches, stomach aches, trouble sleeping, um, having to go to the bathroom all the time. There's the questioning of, am I okay? Is this okay? Do I look okay? Not being able to make a decision, not being wanting to be away from you, not wanting to do sleepovers. And so there's a lot of behavioral and emotional signs that speak to anxiety or worry. Let's just say worry, anxiety, fear on a continuum of that this could be something to look into and look for the patterns. Um, the other thing I'll say is uh, we, we, we really want to try to understand what the patterns and the triggers are said like if it happens every morning before school or every time before soccer practice you know it's usually that has something to do with the warrior fear yeah and that's that's really interesting um and to look kind of through the behavior of what's really happening and what my understanding is is that um we want to be compassionate to kids but it also is not helpful if we continue to let them avoid this and avoid that and avoid this third thing and create this little like bubble around our kids. So how do we like draw that line? You're right. It's a fine line. I, because first of all, we want to have an accurate understanding that's compassionate and something that I'll just say quickly as I'm sitting on my couch that usually my clients sit on, I am remembering this one couple um, because this is, this is, this happens all the time. So there was one member of the couple who had an intense fear of bridges and another one who had an intense fear of public speaking. Not, they each did not have the other person's fear and they each had zero empathy for the other person's fear because they didn't have that fear. And so I was saying like, it's hard to have empathy for something that you don't have. So on that side, you get the parent that's sometimes like, come on, suck it up, let's go. On the other hand, you have parents that have the same fears and have a ton of empathy for the pain that it causes. And then it's kind of like, no, 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 you don't have to, we'll figure it out. And we want to try to find that middle, which is compassion, understanding, but we really want to do what's more formally called exposure therapy. And that's why I wrote the books initially because of my experience with one of my own kids. It's like, I did a lot of this, not as psychologist, but as dad all of this exposure stuff and a lot of this can work 
without professional help. We'll talk about like when to get professional help. And really it's how do you help them practice in micro steps, taking steps towards the fear because we don't want fear to win and fear to run this child's life because it impacts your confidence. And it, and, and conversely, when you can start to overcome things you're afraid of, it just, your confidence just grows. You start to feel like I can overcome things that are hard for me. So I like this. I, uh, I'm vaguely aware of exposure therapy and I maybe just have like a right or wrong understanding of it. So I'd be interested in having, if you could talk through it a little bit, cause like you were saying, there's, there is a time for when to get professional support. And I want to make sure we touch on that as well. But could you say a little bit about exposure therapy, when, it, when to use it, and, and how, like maybe an example of how to use that? Mm -hmm. so, so when we think of exposure therapy, just think of actually how it sounds like you're exposing a person, a ch child, to a stimulus, a fearful stimulus, and you want to do it in increments. So the fancy cognitive behavioral name that some people might have heard of is systematic desensitization. That's, that's a mouthful. And for those of you who remember What About Bob with Bill Murray, uh, it's a classic movie. And it, his character, he goes through what he calls baby steps. And he writes a book called Baby Steps After. And it's a baby, you take baby steps to gradually overcome your fear. So one example would be someone who's af afraid of dogs, which actually I've learned can be really impactful for a family because there are dogs everywhere and then you can't go anywhere where there's a dog, whether it's the park or whether it's an outing or a friend's house or family. So if we look at exposure therapy for a fear of dogs, the first thing you're doing is you are exposing to the least anxiety provoking situation with the dog. For example, looking at a book that has pages with dogs or on your um, screen, dogs, and a child getting used to just looking at a dog. And then at, we call this, we can make a success ladder. Like let's, let's, let's incentivize you to solve this bottom rung, get a victory, and then we go on to the next thing. And the next thing might be is, you know what? Now that you're able to look at dogs, we are gonna go to a park where they have dogs and we're gonna sit in the car and we're gonna be 100 feet away and we're just gonna look at the dogs. So, and you can see how you slowly get closer. Now we're gonna go to a pet store and we're gonna look at dogs who are in cages. And you can stand outside the pet, you know, so you work your way up and I can tell you whether it's a spider or a dog or an elevator, same thing, look at an elevator, get in an elevator, go up one floor. Um, so many success stories where when you're exposing yourself to a stimuli, we, we found that you can't be bored and scared at the same time. So something that you were so afraid of, you're like, okay, the kid's like, this is boring. Okay, I, I can look at pictures of a dog. You're like, all right, let's go get to the next thing. And eventually you have someone petting a dog. You just work your way up. But this works for all of us in anything we're afraid of, including swimming pools, you name it. Okay. So what I heard there, the, the, I think the key you hit at the end was when to move to that next rung is when they're bored or, or would, would it be, is there any other cues to know like, okay, we can go to the next rung. Yes. Another one is this is stupid. Um, well, cause that means they're not scared if it's stupid, right? Well, most of the time, sometimes I'm stupid. This is stupid means like I'm afraid, but so that, and then the other one is, okay, I'm ready. I'm done with this. You know, like any way that you get this indication, like this isn't a big thing anymore. Time to move on. Okay. I like that. I'll have to use that one. What's on? <laughs> this is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to move on. <laughs> um, and then could we, could you just sort of talk a little bit about knowing when to go and get like the professional support? Like, you know, like maybe you try it and it doesn't work, but, but how do we know, even in just interacting with our kids, like this is beyond something that we're just going to try and handle in our home or in our family. Mm -hmm. So the, the technical term we look, we talk about is functional impairment. And what that really means is like, how much is it impacting a child or your, and or your family on a daily basis? And there is no exact, you know, scale that says now, but if you've been dealing with, if your child's been dealing with fears for a long time, when does it get to the point that you know you've tried everything and it is really impacting them? They aren't doing social outings. They are not getting to school. It's a meltdown every single day because of this anxiety trigger. And then you start to see it impact their self-esteem right? Their confidence. And there, for a lot of parents, it, t I mean, it takes a while cause you're trying a lot of things. And then eventually you'll know, it's like, you know what, we need some help somewhere else. And sometimes you're doing and saying all the right things. And it's just that a child needs to hear it 
from someone else other than you. Um, it's just so fascinating that, you know, when you take your, I remember when we were trying to tell our kids about, um, our adolescents about how their phone cannot be by their head in, you know, when they go to sleep and it has to be in a, this far away. I mean, we worked on this forever. And then finally, um, our child's doctor said it to him and he came out and he said, you know what? They made a lot of sense right there. I'm going to, you know, like everything that we've said for months. Right. So we're like, that's a great idea. Right. So sometimes you just need someone else to guide, not only your child, but you, because as we were talking about earlier, there's a lot of things that we need to do as parents to help support the growth and not inadvertently enable. And I, again, I say that with total uh, compassion and non-judgment. Um, as a parent of kids that have struggled with these same issues, it's very easy to, when you're trying to help, to be playing a part in the stuckness. Um, and sometimes we need just some that outside consultation. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Again, I'm wanting to take a step back. <laughs> so I want to circle back around to the exposure therapy concept because I'm realizing that as we're talking and we're three white people, um, that there are other people who are dealing with um, chronic levels of anxiety because of their an unsafe neighborhood because maybe they're afraid of um, police that might in the future sometime target their child because of the color of their skin. Maybe um, there are people in the audience that are dealing with a bad earthquake um, or, or just like super downturn in the economy. We can't really expose ourselves yeah. to those things as easily as we can like go to the park and like look at the dog. So what do, what do we do in those situations when the, the thing that we're afraid of is like in the environment? That's an excellent question. Um, yes. Yeah, so chronic, cro so chronic anxiety or chronic heightened, heightened anxiety does take an impact on our health. Like we know that from studies, right? People who um, are, have to look over their shoulder all the time because of um, potential abuse. Um, whether it is racism, whether it is living in an abusive family, whether it is being in a uh, governmental situation around the world where you are not safe, and whether there's bombings, right, and war. Um, it's very difficult. And what I've learned from readings of like the Dalai Lama and Bishop Desmond Tutu, it's still, you have to accept the reality the best you can and try try the best you can to live in the moment knowing that there these are possibilities so i'm not minimizing um any of the potential tragedy and the um the gosh the conflict and the oppression that many people are living with and have lived with for a long time and i think first of all it's it's self-compassion and an understanding of this is real and this isn't something that we can just self-talk our way out of, as you, as you point out. So another thing that I've been talking about a lot these days um, re relates to all of these issues that you're talking about, which is how do we divide what we can control versus what we have no control over? Because a lot of time where our, our worry and fear take us is towards all these things that we have no control over. Like we have no control over illness. We have no control over how racism, what form it's going to take. We have no control over natural um, disasters as they come or war in our countries. So what can we, how do we separate those two and then just do our very best to focus on the things that we can control, how we can keep ourselves safe, how we can practice daily self-restorative care whether it's meditation or journaling or being in a group or reading ways to deal with very real reality. And so um, I'm glad you asked that. And it's a, it's a heavy, it's a heavy um, topic and question, but so important. And the, and the other thing that I'll say about that is what we know about people living in a heightened state of fear. I mean, it does take an emotional and physiological toll. So there is more at risk for medical issues and there's more um, risk for depression because if we're in a heightened state of anxiety for a long period of time, 
what our neurotransmitters do is they finally just kind of buzz out and then we can kind of slip into a depressed state. Um, so, ah, big sigh. <laughs> yeah, that's tough stuff. And, and, and I kind of hear what you're saying is that it, it's not that we ignore the future. It's not that we're ignoring what could happen. It's that what we're focused on is, is I think the, the distinction I'm hearing a little bit is we can still do things knowing like this is what could happen. You know, we don't know what the economy is going to be like. We don't know what, uh, you know, the political unrest might be. We don't know what uh, it's, you know, th th these unknowns about uh, our, uh, maybe the race that someone is, but rather than dwelling in it and focusing on that, if we focus on what we can control and where we are, it can help in our, uh, our mental health while also taking action on those other things. Is that, is that a fair uh, understanding of what you've said there? That is. Okay. That is. All right. Yeah. And, and that's I think, hard. I think that's hard. <laughs> and I think the taking action piece is really important too, because not only are we doing our own internal work, but whoever you are, we can all like take action to help make things more equal. Um, whether you're part of a, um, a minority group or not, we can, we can take action and, um, and stand up when we see an injustice, uh, which is kind of like, like almost like a social responsibility that we have to mm -hmm. protect others right. from things that we're, that we know because we're all humans, like, Oh wait, that's going to make that person anxious. Or I've heard that that is going to cause anxiety. Let like, let's, let's see what we can do. What do we have control of in right. our own place, in our own time um, to help make the world be better and that that can not only help me calm my own anxiety but yeah. hopefully make things a little better for other people and i think it's such an important conversation because you know we, we are pre-recording this and things just keep changing so rapidly and so who knows what where we're at when this actually goes live and it seems that this applies to all parts of our lives yeah right like there's yeah. the unpredictability and okay. how do we deal with that Agreed. And I, um, I, I want to share something personal, which is happening right now, and I have a feeling will still be happening um, when, when this airs, is that um, so one of our ch kids is very involved in um, the civil rights movement. And so as a parent, um, that's a really, I, we're, my wife and I are very proud, and we've been very scared. And so when I, when I talk about what we can't control, we can't control what happens at those things and what situation that he is in. Um, and all we can do is support him for what he's doing, um, which we support. And at the same time, know that there are things that are out of our control and having to accept, to use that word of um, he's a grown person who has his ideas and is on his life path. And so knowing what we want to do is what we were able to do with our a younger, one of our younger kids is like, you know, no, that's not, we're not okay with that right now because unless we can go, we don't feel that that's safe. And we have, so we had control over that minor, right? But not in this situation. So I'm just saying as a, as a real life example of like how, what we as parents sometimes have to let go of that we don't have control over but if we dwell on all the bad things that could potentially happen in this scenario, which we did for a few nights, um, that does not conducive to sleep or happiness or uh, good or peace of mind. I imagine. And it probably doesn't, um, doesn't help the relationship with the kids yeah. as well. So like there's, there's that balance, right? So I appreciate this. I appreciate this conversation. Um, uh, it's interesting how relevant it is as we've been going through so much as a, as a, as a world, I would say, um, and how important these conversations are to take care of ourselves so that we can still be functional and uh, be mentally healthy. Um, and, and as we're wrapping up, do you have any final words that you would like to say or a big ask for the folks that are here? Um. I, I guess I, my, my, my big, my big, my words and big ask are the same thing. I think is just to um, try to stay present focused 
in your life because we are dealing with so much uncertainty at so many levels. Um, and we always have. Um, I think we like to think that we haven't. Like one of the things our brains do is make us think that things are more predictable and everything's fine when they're actually not, and then we feel good. But we've had so many events over the last several months and that will continue that are so uncertain. So I would say a few things. One is try to stay present and try to separate the difference between what you can't control and what you can't. Um, let's be very open to the world of possibilities as opposed to be constricted on how we think things should be and how they're supposed to be. And finally, uh, a message of hope and faith that uh, all of us humans uh, doing things like you guys are doing right here and putting us all together and putting good stuff out there is that um, that the human spirit will prevail and we will all together become healthier through a, a process. I appreciate that. It's, I think those are those are awesome words. Uh, it's a nice ask. Uh, is there uh, what's what's the best way? So you have a lot of I mean, obviously just in talking with you, people can tell like you have a lot of great information here. You you have you know your your fantastic books, your podcast, your podcast. Yes. How can people find out more about those? What's the best way for them to connect with you and stay in touch with you online? So the best place is uh, the website drdanpeters.com. That has everything kind of put together in one place. So check that out. You can find the websites there, the books there, some blogs there. You can find out about um, our center um, and everything Everything that we do ends up living there. That's excellent. We'll put a link uh, to that in the speaker notes. And uh, we really appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, you know, the, what you're saying right now is so relevant now more than ever possibly. And I uh, appreciate the support that you're providing for families, for kids, and, uh, and for us here and talking with us as part of this uh, conference. And so we look forward to talking to you again and uh, keeping in touch with you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you both, guys. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.